And then we couldn't publish it, because everywhere we tried to publish, they said, have you done a control group where they didn't have the, the, this sort of evaluation? And you think, well, of course we didn't do a control group, because we'd sort of built it to, to make for, up for the fact it didn't work very well with this evaluation. And uh, no, so we hadn't got a control group. But when we went into EQ, we decided that we would prove that it was as good as an ordinary evaluation. So we have this, uh, we have this application called Mixer, which is, a, which is now nearly finished, actually, but it's quite different to how it was then. And we looked at it at a low fidelity stage. And what we had was, we, we had this, it's, um, it's about cross-cultural conflict. At the time, at the very beginning, when we started working on MIPSA, we used the, um, the idea of hide-and-seek as a game that every child knows, and every child, not every child, but children play it differently. So some people play blocky one, two, three, and some people play uh, when you tag people, and some people just if you see them, so there's a lot of different rules. And the whole point of this sort of MIPSA idea was that uh, people fight when their rules are different and they don't understand other people's rules. So that was kind of the idea that we went with. And uh, we looked at all the different things we were going to have to look at, like usability and cultural data and uh, the various questionnaires. We put them all together. And we made, um, we made a, a really, like an annual, like, you know, how, or like a, a summer, so it's for 10-year-olds, like a summer special, you know, when you go to the shop and you get a summer special for the kids and there's like word search and all that sort of thing. We made that and we did... Uh, three variants of it. A seamless variant where it was meant to be all trans like transmedia and everything together and working well. And then uh, we did one where it was a bit of both, where there were some questionnaires which were like psychologists say four things. And then we did, um, and we did one that was just the psychology-ish bit. Yes, that wasn't popular. And what we found when we went out to schools was that the, the, the uh, it wasn't just a you got the same data as so you got massively better data if it was nicer. So in the version where it all was seamless and integrated and like a proper annual, they were there for... Uh, it, it became obvious. We did it in an old church, which wasn't very warm, and three separate bits with these three groups of kids. And then the first, the first two groups were finished, and the group that had the integrated, seamless version, they had to have an extra hour to finish it off because they wrote so much, they wanted to tell us so much, they wanted to draw pictures, they gave us extra, it was like a comic book, they gave us extra frames that they felt should add to the story, and all of this, it was, and it was noticeable. And we were just trying to prove that it was as good, but then we proved it was better, so that was really nice, and, uh, and we published that, which was good. So yes, we found it added value, and, and everybody, what, what I used to find when I used to do Fear Not, I used to go to these schools, I used to have these, miserable looking kids and uh, there's only so much jollying along you can do and uh, whereas when you do this they're happy they're, ha they're happy for you to come back as well so that's quite nice because sometimes they uh, have a hard time so now with mixer we've moved on to a longitudinal evaluation we've now got a real application that's just about to go into school it's going to go in i think we're going to do um we've got quite a big evaluation going on but the pro we've and we're doing it in the classroom and although we've looked for user roles that are uh, you know, that are fun, where you're a player, or a gamer, or a, somebody having a good time, a space cadet. The reality is, if it's in the classroom, you are a learner. And we just faced fact eventually, and decided we'd, we'd go for, and it looks like a workbook that kids do in schools. Uh, so it's very structured. But the teachers are, are, were happier with that, everybody was happier with that, and, and it works alright. We've, we've piloted a bit, and it works. So the questionnaires look a bit like this. They're not quite, these are early versions, they're nicer than this now, but this sort of thing makes a huge difference to children. I think adults would be slightly more discerning, but children are, if you make them look nice. And I don't, I, I'm not, even as simple actually, with putting flowers and things on girl things, and little cars on boy things, and it's very archetypal, but you just have to go with that. Uh, people are much keener. Even just like instructions put like that makes a huge difference to whether people will fill it in. And that's meet new people. So it's all, and it's about camping. This new, uh, this new application. So everything's kind of got a camping flavour. And we then, and we took it in in a little workbook form. That's our the EQ mascot, this little orange man. And they were all, uh, all delighted. They look happy, don't they? They're very happy. And yet they filled in quite a lot of hard and tedious questionnaires, and used something that broke in the middle. So, but they were happy with that. 
And we also have another variant of myths that we haven't, uh, that we've only done once, where the child takes on a real role as a reality star. When we actually take them out of the class and we say, we, and we say, we're, we're, we're sort of terrible liars, we say we're making a, a documentary, we're going to make a documentary like it's going to go on the telly. We might put it on a website, imagine we've got all these ethics forms where we're allowed to use their images. So we could do that. So we go in and we say they're going to be like the star in a reality show. And we've, we've done one where we've got people to do like a photo shoot in the classroom of what they should do in the classroom and how they're interacting. And if you get a child to say how they're going to interact, it's poised like that, it's really funny. And uh, we also do this thing. So we get them, we get them to go through it, and they do it, and they phone. And then we do this thing, it's, we call it um, the football manager's booth. So it's like, you know, when you're watching the telly, watching the football, and after the match, the footballer's on, and there's all the logos behind him, and he's giving it, well, we're playing all right, the lads are playing all right, we did this, we did that. We'll get them to do that, and we say, well, how did, the, how did your experience go into that? Was this like this, was that? And they answer, they're from football managers, and that, that works really, really well. And then at the end, they come out, and we have, this red carpet thing, and one of our teams a photographer, and she's snapping that way. And they love it. And they, uh, they really buy into being reality stars. We haven't, uh, we haven't, we're waiting for the final version of Mixer to do that properly, and we're going to do that in Germany as well. And it'll be very interesting to see if German kids buy in, I think. We now, and the next one we've got is this traveller effort, and this is, um, and I don't know whether, the, I don't know whether we've got a video of that. I was, I was going to bring a video, but I didn't. So, and that's just being, uh, and that's about cultural communication, and it's, um, it's that's nice. It looks nice, and it's, it you went to, apart from the, whoever designed it has, at one stage you have to do this, you have to do this to make it of a gesture. You have to actually get down and like this, and everybody sort of who's not like twenty five kind of get down very quick, <laughs> and you don't, and you can't make it work because you're sort of stuck hovering in the middle. Uh, yeah, I've had a problem with it that. So it's about these people. This guy going on a journey, effectively, and on the journey he finds things out about different cultures. Yeah, if anyone wants to see if I did have any video. When we first got it, they built it in a beer garden, a virtual beer garden, and we used beer mats as a narrative element, and that went, that, that went down great. People were very happy to fill in questionnaires, but I would never ever recommend doing a round questionnaire. It took so long to put it out. It looked great, it took ages, ages. And that worked well, and people were happy with it. We could see it worked. Um, with the travel evaluation, we have lots of invisible logging going on. We've got Connect and all of that kind of thing, and skeleton stuff, and all sorts of really clever stuff. And then we've got these four questionnaires that come into play. And uh, we're kind of working at the moment, because we've just got it, as to how we're going to evaluate it nicely. And we have one approach, which is diplomat training, where we say to people this is an application about, um, about how to work with foreigners effectively, and we bring people along and uh, we put them through a half day training, uh, where we have, and it's not hard to do these things, because you want, to do the props and things isn't very difficult, you're quite easy to talk about the EU for an hour, <coughs> you know, most of us could talk about the EU for days I think, and, we, um, and the other thing with Traveller is we want to use, or we do use, um, electrodes and stuff like things on, and there's why do you why are you getting people to do that because evaluation can be uh, intrusive and having an electrode stuck on you is really quite intrusive and why are you having that done but if you say to people well you need to know this because it's part of being a diplomat and, you know you might have to go somewhere where they do that to people oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we're just terrible terrible so we've done that that looks that looks all right so people come in and they do the electrodes and the connect. It's great. It's, you know, it will work well, and we're all ready to go with it. Um, and we debrief, and it's just that you. And it's, again, it's this thing. You get them into Rail straight away. That they're, they're, they're trained to be diplomats. They're buying into it because they're, they're trained to be diplomats. And PowerPoint have a marvelous range of certificates that you can give to people to say they've been diplomat training. <laughs> I mean, really, it's not. Uh, and all and everybody likes getting them. I'm not sure why, but. Uh, Pointless. And then we've had another, because we've had plenty of time, because it hasn't quite appeared as quickly as we would have liked, Traveller. But we've got another one, we call the airport hub. And instead of um, it being diplomat training, people are on a journey, I think it's because we want to dress up as air hostesses this time. And uh, we have them, and we, what we're going to do is we're going to have three locations, and we're going to take people in and out the centre as if they're going through airports. And we've got a passport activity. 
So you have a passport, you'll be in the role going from place to place to these different countries that are part of this, uh, this thing. And we're going to use the evaluator, because you always have to act as an evaluator. We're going to use us as like customs staff to get them to explain what they're doing. And we're going to get them to pack a bag and things like that, just to see what they do. And because there's, uh, there's quite a lot of um, activities that are just adding value that don't really, we don't really use this evaluation, it's just to make it more fun. And this looks like that. So they come in, they sign up, it's all on the phone, and we still with a hat on. Then you go to the passport, you pack your bags, then you're in the departure land, then you go to the different countries and do the different things. And uh, we haven't done that properly, we've only walked through that, and it's worked well as a walkthrough. And it's uh, been quite good fun, and we don't quite know how well that will go until we've got the application, which we get at the end of May. And finally, in my research group, which uh, we're really interested in frightening people. So we're interested in affect, but people are only interested in positive affect. We want to know about, not negative affect, but thrilling affect. So, and there's no, there could be nothing worse good than if you were being, like, being scared if someone said, are you scared then? What do you feel in this questionnaire about being scared? And you think that's not going to work. So we've, uh, we've looked at how they might frighten people more through the evaluation approach. So imagine, so we're doing like we're doing a scary campus, so this is our reception, you go in, it's on layer, it's, you hold your phone up and you get the ghosts at reception. Nothing really does much more than be there at the minute. And this is these, this is how our our um, vice pro vice chancellor's obsessed with having charts with dots and targets and, and it now if you stand in front of it, it melts. Which is something <laughs> fantastic. And we have the fires of hell in his office. It's like they come out of it, you can go past into the fire flicker. And, and uh, what we thought with the evaluation of that, and we've just started working on this, is that if, that if you look at things like think aloud methodologies, and you're saying to people, what are you doing? Why are you doing it? What are you hoping to get from that? If you're walking down a corridor where there's ghosts and things, and the phone goes and someone says, what are you doing? What are you doing? Why are you doing that? Why? Why? Like that. Then people get really frightened. And uh, we're not quite sure of the ethics of that yet. We haven't gone down that line. But uh, yes, we think of, but there's quite a lot of interest in it. And uh, students are very interested when they're... And they have found what we've done without being told it's there because they walk about with their phones. So that's very interesting, this whole idea of can you use evaluation? Not so in that way, the, the narrative relies on the evaluation much stronger because you're adding... Because all you've got on the phone is a fairly rubbishy picture. Whereas what you want to do is to frighten people. Is that it? So anyways, the costs and benefits of all of this integration. I used to say, oh, it's expensive to do in a transmedia evaluation. It takes a long time. You've got to think. But it's not expensive. It's really cheap to do it. It takes a lot of thought. And you've got to do everything up front long before uh, the day comes of the evaluation. You've got to practice. Otherwise, it goes hideously wrong. But it isn't expensive. It's cheap to provide this sort of tacky. It's like, you know, when you're, if, if you go to a theatre and you look at the props and the set, it's not really painted properly and they're not really proper props. So it's like that. I mean, not like what they have for like the big films, but if you go to an amateur dramatics thing. So, uh, so all of that, it takes time and it takes thought, but it doesn't take a lot of cost, so it's quite cheap to do it. And the benefits are that everybody, I mean, I've done evaluations. I think a long time ago, we dragged, when I, and we made the whole of the e-circus team come to the evaluation and do the evaluation. And they were so tired. I don't think they sound even that. We, we, you were all so tired with how tired it is to do an evaluation. That was just a straight evaluation. It is very tiring. And it is hard work. Uh, but it's, the benefit is everybody has a good time, including the evaluator. Because you come out of it having had a laugh. Whereas you can come out of an evaluation and everything breaks, you just think, oh God, no. Whereas this, you just think, oh, it doesn't matter, we'll just write it up. So what we found with integrating all of our value this kind of approach is that this is what we've got, is that the user's happy, we're happy in role with our strange clothes on. And that what happens is that the interaction becomes within the evaluation and that becomes part of the experience. So it's one coherent thing that people are enjoying doing and having lots of different sorts of media and different things going on keeps it very entertaining. However, my, um, my research and I, this is only this week we've been, because of, of me coming to do this actually, we're talking about it. Is what we're doing ultimately participatory design at the end? 
So I started to think, have I gone round a full circle back to participatory design? Because when I first became a, an interaction designer, things didn't work very well a long time ago. And now I think, and now we're always making up for that and how we design the interface. And now I think, are we making up for the fact now that it doesn't work very well by how we design the evaluation? And is it sort of just in time participatory design? And that has, we've started to think about that quite a bit. Is it, you know, that are these applications that we evaluate fit for purpose? Do they really work? Could they work without us standing there holding them together? And the answer is not really. Is the usability all right? Not really, not always. Uh, and you can get over it by that. And uh, the other thing is that we, uh, we also thought of this is, one of the big problems with evaluation, if you're in charge of evaluation, is you start day one of the project to do your evaluation, if you're an evaluation partner. But by a day, many, many days later, like the end of year two, you still have got any software. And you spend two years thinking about this evaluation. And uh, if you've been told you're going to get a, you're going to get a hand-shaped thing to evaluate, you do build a glove. And we found that we get, then get a foot this over the hand. So it's very hard to, and if you're very, if you think that's how we're going to do it, you're stuck. Whether you know it doesn't matter. It's the same whether it's a hand or a foot, it just goes on it. And we found that a, a big, uh, and, we, and that is kind of alien. And whilst there are some psychologists who are very on for that, most psychologists are quite down the line and don't like those last minute changes. And that's kind of a bit of a disadvantage of it. But we found it very, uh, we found ourselves, we, we've become very laid back and very calm about things because you can react and respond quite quickly if you think it doesn't have to be, we're not, it's not a Hollywood production, it's like an Amdram thing, it's become much calmer. So in summary, I, the um, narrative does offer evaluation this way through the, the sort of the tedium and the boredom and it's very, very useful and very good for gathering R&D data. It's good data, it's quality data, there's a lot of it. Uh, people don't miss out questions, that's an interest. We did, of the, on the, when we looked at people missing out questions, on the one that was like, like all together in an annual in front, there was like, I think only 4% of questions that got missed out, whereas on the other one there was 60%. And one questionnaire, nobody in one group answered, didn't bother. Because they weren't, and that was quite interesting. With uh, Orient, users didn't know and really enjoyed themselves. With Mixer, it worked. With Traveller, we can make things like sticking on electrodes seem part of the game, part of the narrative. And with, uh, with what we're doing with the fear, we think we can get over the, over the shortcomings and user experience. And I think that, for me, I have to say that it's made evaluation a much more palatable and enjoyable thing by giving it a story and giving it a bit of life. And, uh, and I would recommend it to anybody. So, if anybody, I think I've caught your time of Sandy. So, any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Um, it seems to me that uh, depending on the kind of role you're asking the participants to take on, that's going to adjust their uh, perceptions of their experience. So if you, for instance, were trying to uh, put them in a situation where they were getting ready for uh, a flight abroad, uh, that would be one, one experience and they'd be potentially answering questions in role. Uh, if you were to ask the same questions whilst they were in uh, a zombie epidemic, that would put them in a completely different, well, a different frame of mind. Yes, indeed. So, well, that's, so with Traveller, uh, we have this um, diplomatic workshop thing going on. It's the same question as so that. We have the air hostess thing going on. And we're also looking at one where we're trying to make it like a, sort of a cultural Cluedo, where it's more like a treasure hunt. Uh, much, and we're going to ask exactly the same questions and see if there is a difference. Because hmm. we don't know. It's the moment. Because logically, you think if you're a zombie ep epidemic, you're going to be answering a different way. To, but we don't know if people will. But we're going to look at that this summer. Because you've got the problem with it is, is it's quite hard to, um, with to comp it's quite hard to evaluate an evaluation without doing the same evaluation or a variant of it over and over again. But this summer we've got time to do three. If a traveller is ready and that's just look at Ruth there. If Traveller's ready and all the rest, we will be going for doing three different ones. Uh, quite different where we've got one where it's quite sort of dull and linear, one where it's fun and in the, the airport, well, or sort of interesting, and one where it's a culture, sort of treasure hunt and exciting. So we, and I think we will get different answers. Yeah, I think, I mean, dull versus exciting is, is yeah. going to answer one question, but I think, you know, 
asking someone to be in a role where they're meant to be being brave, for instance, and are in a role where they're meant to be being inquisitive. It's different, uh, yeah. I think it could be, because yeah. I think people will answer the questions depending yeah, yeah. on the role that they're adopting. Rather than and hopefully we'll, we'll see that. But, uh, I hope that we'll see that. But it will be interesting to see that if people do answer. And if they don't, it'll be really interesting. If it's steady across the three different conditions, it'll be quite interesting. <coughs> but I'm not sure. Just to link on to, to that, really, because uh, you, know, you mentioned uh, Hope is Missing Pandemic, say, and if you take that uh, category of uh, alternate reality gaming type things, um, again, it's this question about embedding the evaluation, whether that will influence what you get. And maybe that's not a meaningful question, but um, for instance, when the, the um, Channel 4 had um, two examples, one on genetics and one on online identity, really, and that was interesting because when there were elements within those games which were about evaluation, which were used by the people who uh, um, produced them, and then there was the sort of like the high level evaluation that was done by Channel 4, and actually there was a disagreement there yeah. because, you know, the question was, okay, people are engaged, they like this stuff, so they're going to say good things, but then if they're more dispassionate away from it looking objectively, then they might reflect differently. So how did you answer that question? Well, I think that what, what we're trying to do is we're trying to evaluate within the experience. So I don't want people to go away and reflect. I don't, I don't, I don't think that's how things... Because then what are you evaluating? You're evaluating people's memory of something. Because I, I think you should evaluate as you're going through things. Uh, so I think this high-level sort of uh, evaluation, I, I don't think that... Eva I think that's just... I don't believe that actually evaluates anything. I think it evaluates memories and perceptions of how it went when you've had time to think about it. And everybody's thoughts, you know, everybody when they look back at how, they, at how something went, it's very different to how they went when it was actually happening. So I, I like my evaluation in the middle. I want it in there. I don't want it separate at all. And I, I would expect to get different results, um, you know, if I went back... Uh, if I went, if you got something to do something, and then three hours later or a day later, you asked them how it went, I would expect very different results than if I'd asked them immediately afterwards. I think that's inevitable, and I, I'm not sure. Quite often, when they say to people, "How was it for you? Was it engaging? Was it was it enjoyable? Was it this? Was it that?" You know, when you look back at something, if you're a kind of half glass half full empty, you generally think, "Oh, yeah." It was Unless if something terrible happened and it was all not good, you, you will look back and think, yeah, it was okay. Whereas if you're a more sort of pessimistic person, you're more likely to say it wasn't okay. And I think it's, I think by taking people away from what they've participated in, that you're not, you're evaluating something different to the actual experience itself. I, I think I've thought that for a long time. What you're saying is uh, it's something that in virtual reality has been going on for a while, which is trying to measure the experience while it takes place rather than ask a question at the end. So it sounds to me that it's very much this what you're trying to do, to embed the, um, you well, know, the evaluation I, I in the experience. That. Yeah. I came so, from that idea, yeah, because it, it's so bad, the evaluation of virtual reality. Yeah. That, so uh, the problem yeah. is that uh, there is a lot of research, for example, in finding out whether you're not you're engaged or whether you're not you are uh, emotionally engaged or enjoyment mm -hmm. and blah, blah, blah. And in particular, we run the PhD research, which... Um, um, is now working for Mel Slater, actually, just to give you an idea that that's the kind of things. And, um, and, and what we found is that when we measure the physiological reaction within the experience, there was a, a, a type of emotion. But when we asked them to fill the, you know, not even a questionnaire, a picture, because that's quicker and easier, uh, you know, there was some time and often mismatch between what they really felt uh, as measured and what they reported they did because it, you already reflected, oh yeah, well I know that was a game and, yeah, and I wasn't scared really. There's also this issue you know. about, is when, it's when your body lets you down, you know what I mean? Like when you're, when you know, when you go to, uh, when you're in a job interview and you're really nervous and your body's letting you down, even though your mind's thinking a different thing, is that what your mind thinks and what your body does is not the same thing at all. So I'm not, I know, it's no surprise that they only have that <coughs> So what, all I'm trying to say is that by putting a transmedia, you're just trying to carry out the same emotion yeah. that you had in the game a little bit longer 
so that you can capture them in the questionnaire. So no, it seems to no, me... No, 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 we're not trying to do that. We use Transmedia to... Um, we, use tra we use Transmedia to create the questionnaires, as it were, to create the instruments. So we're hiding the instruments within the narrative. We don't use... We're not trying to extend the story arcs particularly with, the, with that. It's just to hide it. That's why we do it, so people don't realise they're being evaluated. Because automatically when people are being evaluated, they get like negative about it. So it's just to stop that happening. Yeah, but if the experience in the first place was not enjoyable, then what happened with the props? So if you don't like a film, you don't like the prop of the film either. So what I'm saying is that you are trying to um, carry out to, uh, to um, you know, by using the same graphics, let's say, yeah, so the same font. I know that you like those fonts, so I keep on giving you those fonts. You're building on sort of a positive. No, we don't do that now. We've talked a lot about that as, are um, we changing the mood? And do, do we, as, or is that what we're doing? And what, no, what not changing the mood necessarily, but simply capitalising on that mood. Well, we're capitalising on people having fun, because when you're with interact with interactive things, you're meant to be having So what fun. happened if they did, wasn't fun? So well, they filled the questionnaire. So it always has been so far, that, and it's been not fun when we didn't do it. That's where, the, that's where we've been most surprised, is that simply by making the evaluation in a certain way, you can add to the fun. That's been a surprise. We didn't expect it to happen. We, did, we didn't expect that, and it did. And this was. Oh uh, yeah, the last one. Um, sorry. Uh, uh, I'm very interested in your methods because it seems to me that what you're talking about involves embedding these um, transmedia evaluations into your narrative experience. Requires two forms of hiding, and I think one Alex Mitchell's already talked about um, or asked you about, which is. The idea that assuming that this evaluation is narratively legible, assuming that yeah. we're experiencing this as narrative, uh, how do you make sure that doesn't infect the rest of the narrative yeah, changing? Yeah. But the other type, which is one that I really want to ask you about, is uh, how do you ensure that people recognise it as narrative at all? How do you how do you ensure that they don't just say, "Hold on, that's a questionnaire." They don't. We didn't. We didn't. It was it was completely serendipitous. That's the point that we we, we went with this. Uh, Orient evaluation, because Orient didn't work very well. We went with this fun thing to do and we had a great graphics person. And we didn't really expect people not to realise it. Because yeah. they looked like questionnaires. They, they looked, they, and, but nobody... So you weren't actively designing no, them to... And, we didn't to start with, and then we realised that we had by mistake. We went to Portugal, and we went, and it was like a Portugal. It's a really good university, like yeah. you know, go to Oxford or somewhere. And you're at this university with all these clever, clever people doing computer science. Not and and, and they they didn't realise. That was very interesting. That the people <coughs> in Portugal who were you know grown ups doing PhDs and things, they didn't realise because it. Didn't because the questionnaire is A4, black on white, one, two, I three, see. four, lick and scale, one, two, three, four, five. People are looking, that's what a questionnaire yeah, is. So when we see it at any other form, that schema just isn't activated. And it's just when you know result. that, when you know that, you then become aware of how often you're being asked questions in marketing literature and things that don't look like questionnaires. So if we wanted to, if I say wanted to learn how to do these invisible questionnaires, but maybe I'm not as talented as the people that you've got on your team. Who are doing them? Maybe when I design one, it sort of comes out looking a bit like a lickhead scale because I'm not very creative. What sort of literature can I read to make sure that doesn't happen? I think you've just got. What I think you have to do is to test a lot. Is to test and to also is to accept you can be wrong. That the biggest advantage is to say that's not right and to be able to say that often. If the biggest thing is for all of us as a group, we drink a lot of coffee and we spend a lot of time scribbling things out and saying that doesn't work and this doesn't work, is to accept the fact that there is not one right solution. To accept the fact also that the right solution doesn't work when you give it to a user, and that's fine. That you've just got to keep going back and it will work eventually. And the big thing is just to have lots of colour and it, what, what we did was we looked at the media for the age groups that what it was meant for. We looked at magazines, so we do children, we looked at a lot of websites, a lot of literature for 10 year olds. Not, not like literature, like clever written stuff, but mm -hmm. like, you know, like Doctor Who magazine and things like that. And that, that is where you can see, and that when you look at that, you think, is that a really questionnaire? Mm -hmm. Everybody knows how to fill in a questionnaire. Like you don't need to give kids instructions for how to fill in a questionnaire, they know, because they're always filming it. So yes, so, so I would, and don't be put off of your first one bombs, just think, next time we'll be all right.